Good morning. I want to welcome you to the worship service of Trinity Associate Reform Presbyterian Church here in Tampa, Florida. Today is April 26, 2020, and I have a few announcements to make. First, the Probst family has asked for prayer. Um, Chris is taking chemotherapy treatments and is doing pretty well, but I uh, appreciate prayer for her strength and as she goes through these, and of course, healing. And then her son, Brett, <clears throat> who lives here in Tampa, has uh, a fever and coughs and chills. And so we appreciate prayer for him. And then also for Karen, her daughter is in New York City. And just uh, as that's the epicenter of the COVID-19 in America, we pray uh, ask for prayer for her for protection and safety from this. I just mentioned about our offerings have continued to uh, be strong, and we want to thank you all for that, for everyone who is giving. If you would uh, like to uh, continue giving to us, please mail it to the church, 14925 North Boulevard, uh, Tampa, Florida, 33613. And then um, we just pray that the offerings will continue to to cover our bills and to continue the ministry of this church during this unusual time. I also want to ask for feedback. I'd mentioned that before in the first week or two. I got good feedback and I appreciate that. But you can email me or text me or just old fashioned give me a phone call. And I would appreciate getting a chance to hear from you. Uh, our call to worship this morning is from Psalm chapter 20 and different verses from Psalm chapter 20. <clears throat> May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious and will lift up our banner in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Let's bow and pray. <clears throat> Our Lord God, we come to you once again in this time. We pray that you would be faithful to all of your people, that we might see your great hand as you have promised in your covenant, that you will be with your people and guide us and protect us and guard over us. And we ask that prayer today, Lord, that we might find you faithful in the midst of all our problems. And we pray, Lord, that you would find us faithful, that we would continue in our worship, that we would find ways of expressing a praise to you and thanksgiving to you. May we be able to look beyond the problems of this world and look to a great God who is victorious and reigning and over all things. We thank you, Lord, for your sovereignty, that you are in control and your providence, that nothing happens without your knowledge of it and awareness of it and in fact, of your hand in all that occurs. And we pray, Lord, that we might trust you, that we would put our faith deep and strong in the almighty God, and that we would find your help in the day of trouble. We do pray for our country that we would be able to recover quickly from this coronavirus, both the economical effects and the health effects. We pray that you would heal those who have this, disease, and we pray that you would uh, cause it to quit spreading and to, uh, to fade away to no longer be a problem. We pray for those who are working in the medical field, those who are on the front lines, doctors and nurses. We specifically mention Nazetta's niece, who is a nurse in New York City, and pray for safety and protection for her and for strength to carry on her work, not only physical strength, but also emotional and spiritual strength that she and the others need at this time. We pray, Lord, that you would 
touch each one and bless them. And we pray for those who are seeking a remedy to this disease and also for those who are seeking vaccines that you would um, speed along their studies and research and pray that this would happen soon. We pray too for the government leaders, for our president and Congress, and then also for the different governors of the various states, that you would give them wisdom to know when is the best time to reopen our country in that sense and to get back to, quote, normal, that we would uh, see the changes come about, uh, that we may be active again in our social lives and in our activities. We pray, too, Lord, for the Probst family, that you would bless Brett, that he might recover quickly. We pray for Chris to sustain her through this chemotherapy treatment and to heal her completely. We lift up uh, Karen, also called Lou, and pray that you would bless her in New York City and keep her safe. We lift up our missionaries all around the world. Pray for them as they seek creative ways to minister in the midst of this time of so-called social distancing. And bless each one, we ask for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading, and I hope you can get a Bible and turn with me to John chapter 17. Today we're reading from verse 1 through verse 12. John 17, the high priestly prayer. Uh, John 17, beginning at verse 1 and reading down through verse 12. Hear now God's holy and inspired word of truth. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have, everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. Today's sermon is entitled Christ's Petition. For your protection. Last Sunday we looked at John 17, especially verses 1 through 5, and talked about prayer and revival, that these two go in hand. If we are going to experience revival in our land, uh, we need to pray. And Jesus said, um, Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them to pray. And so we need to learn to pray. Uh, prayer seems to come automatically, and it should. There's a right sense of talking to God that is a simple thing, but also the Bible implies that there's a need to learn how to pray. And so we look at Jesus' prayers, and this one in particular, the pr prayer we call the high priestly prayer. And we look at the words that Jesus taught as a model, uh, as Jesus prayed as a model for our prayers, but also we look at what he prayed for for us, and we learn and experience a closer relationship with him through understanding his concerns for us. The first section we looked at last week has to do with Jesus' petition to 
be glorified and that God has fulfilled that um, purpose for Jesus in his completing his mission on earth of coming to earth and dying on the cross, rising again and ascended into heaven. And now we come to some other petitions. The one today is for protection for believers. And the second section is 6 through 19, which Jesus prays for his disciples. And so he's praying in this petition today for protection for them from the evil one. Uh, next week, we will look at Jesus' prayer for unity, his petition for unity, and then his petition for joy. I may have those reversed. I think joy comes before the unity in the passage. But we will look at those. But today, we're looking at uh, Jesus' prayer for protection. And the first thing I noticed here is that Jesus recognizes God's sovereignty in, as he prays for protection. In this passage, Jesus adheres to the sovereignty of God. It is God who saves, and it's Jesus who reveals to us that we need to be saved, and he brings believers into uh, a knowledge of Jesus Christ, the revelation of who God is, and that we are to come to him, that we are sinners, and that we need him, and we need to be saved. Jesus reveals here through our prayer that we can receive Christ as our Savior. But it's only for those who have been chosen and called and who have been predestinated to come to God. And we, so, we see here in this passage that Jesus is a Calvinist. Oops, wait a minute. That sounds funny. We see here that, I don't want to get the cart before the horse. I should say that Calvin is a Jesusist. It's hard to say. But Calvin's theology and Calvin's uh, understanding of Scripture, along with Augustine and many other great theologians, is that God is sovereign in all things. And we, we usually think of this in the teachings of Paul and other places, but in John chapter 10 and here in John 17, we see clearly that Jesus is expounding to us and teaching us that God is in control of all things, that God is sovereign over all things. And that's a shock for some people, but it shouldn't be because Jesus says here that he revealed God to his people, to those that God had, that God had everyone, but he particularly had his um, select, his chosen ones, whom Jesus revealed uh, God to us. Man is incapable, incapable, Man is unable, man is not able to come to God in our own strength, in our own ability. Man must have some outside help. And so verse 6 tells us that Christians are those that God gave to Jesus. And we look back in the passage from last week, we see that God gave Jesus authority in verse 2 over all people that he might give eternal life to all those that God gave to him. And so we see in our passage today that Jesus is revealing himself to his people, not to everyone in the world, but to his people, those who are chosen and called to come to God. Uh, John 6, also says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. God is the initiator. God is the one that calls us. And in fact, brings us into the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we see in the fourth point of Calvinism, this idea that God always gets his man, the effectual calling that God effectively calls those who are predestined and brings them to the point of salvation. What a wonderful, wonderful teaching of the teaching of grace. Some people say, no, I don't want to be under grace. I don't, but you sure don't want to be under law because no one can meet up to the standards of God's law. So no one would be saved. But God in his grace chooses and brings some to the point of salvation. Oh, but you might say, yeah, but you have to believe, you have to accept, and verse six says that. They obeyed your word. 
And so man does response. And verse 8b says they believed. And another verse, and as I was reading, said they accepted. And so, yes, it's paramount importance that we believe in the Lord Jesus, that we express our acceptance of Christ. And you say, well, that shows that there's no predestination. No, it doesn't. It shows God is bringing us to that point. As Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You see, the faith that we express is not even of ourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. And so we thank God for his great grace and for his giving us this great work of salvation. Of course, Romans 8 and 9 and Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 11 especially speak of this predestination. But I wanted to focus here today in the book of John and especially in chapter 17. Predestination and man's choosing God are like two rails of the railroad track. They seem like they're far apart and they'll never come together. But if you look off in the distance, it looks like those rails come together. Another example is of the uh, man who said, when I came to Christ, it was like a door that said, whosoever will may come. And I walked through that door and then I looked on the other side and it had my name. And it said, chosen from the foundation of the earth. And so God does his work. It's mysterious to us how these two work together, but in heaven we'll understand it. But as for now, we, we act upon the word of God. We come and acknowledge his sovereignty and his calling us to come to him and to believe in him. But when it comes to prayer, we also acknowledge God's sovereignty, don't we? Some people don't. We think that we can manipulate God. But I want you to know when you come to pray to God, don't try to manipulate him. Some people say, well, God, you said if I say such and such words, then you have to do what I said to do. do. No, he does not. When we come to prayer, we come acknowledging that God is sovereign. And we try to align our wills with God's will. In the Lord's Prayer, for example, Jesus said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so when we're praying, we pray that God will align our wills and that we will pray in accordance with God's will. In the Garden of Gethsemane, of course, Jesus told his request, but then he said, not my will, but thy will be done. Here in this passage, we see that he prays for things that he knows are in in agreement with God's will. Protect them from the evil one. Someone always asks this question then, well, if God is sovereign, he knows all things, he's in control of all things, why bother to pray? And the answer is very simple. He commands us to pray. Case closed, that's it, right? God tells you to pray, so pray. You don't need anything else, but praise the Lord, he gives us other reasons here too. A second reason that we should pray, knowing that God is sovereign, is that it's a blessing for us. He gives us peace in the midst of the storm when we take our burdens off ourselves and put them on the Lord. And we trust him to take care of us and we pray for his protection for God's people. And so we have an assurance in our prayers and we have peace in our prayers. But there's one other reason I'm going to mention today, and maybe y'all could come up with lots of others. But one other prayer reason we should pray to a sovereign, almighty God is that prayer changes things. What? You say, no, pastor, you're just contradicting yourself. The Bible says that prayer is a mystery. Deep calleth unto deep, Psalm 42, 7. Romans 8 verse 26 says that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. When we do not know how to pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings and murmurs that we can't understand, but God prays for us in this deep way and helps us in our prayers when we don't know how to pray. 
And in fact, if you really understood predestination, it gives greater assurance to answered prayers. When you say, I'm going to pray according to God's will, and by that I'm asking God, how should I pray today? What is it you want me to pray? And that doesn't mean you can't struggle with God and go, how about this? And then seek that to know God's will. And you may not know God's will perfectly, but you're seeking to know his will. And you're trying to pray in accord with his will. And God puts the desires on your heart. What a joy. What an excitement to pray in that way. What a wonder to see the answers that God gives us to prayer. That God does show us these wonderful things. Oh, I loved our growth group we had back in our other church where we would keep a record of the answers of our prayer requests. We had a list and we would write down the prayer requests and then there was a space. We put the date on it in the space where you said when the prayer request was answered and the date it was answered. And that's a great adventure to see how God answers our prayers. And it's a wonderful thing. And sometimes it's in very small things and very small ways. But nevertheless, God is great and mighty in all answers to prayer. Well, God is sovereign in our prayer, in his prayer for our protection. And God's sovereignty gives assurance of God's protection for us. In verses 9 and 10, Jesus shows his unique concern for Christians. He says here, I'm not praying for the world, but for you. This may strike some people as not so good, but guess what? Jesus is partial. Jesus is prejudiced. Jesus has a special love and care for his children, for Christians. Verses 11 and 15 again, Jesus on earth says, while, they, while I was on earth, I protected them by God's name. Now he's about to leave and he asks the Father to continue to protect them. And he says, with in God's sovereignty, none has been lost except, of course, Judas, the one doomed to destruction and fulfilled the scripture, the Lord's will. And he goes on and talks about assurance of salvation is based on God's sovereignty because God is the one who saved you. You can be assured that God will keep you for all eternity. Some people don't like those words, once saved, always saved. I don't know why you don't like it, but I think it's based on having once definitely been saved, not just think you're saved, but you definitely were saved, then you will always be saved. And Romans 8, 29 and 30 gives us that formula. And again, Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion until the day of Christ Jesus. If you saved yourself, and you can't, but just let's think figuratively here for a minute, or theoretically, if you could save yourself by your own force, by your own strength, then you could lose your salvation. But because it's God's great arm that reaches down and he pulls you up, then you can't be lost, that he has you in his arms. And he takes care of you. Imagine if the Coast Guard went out to rescue someone and they got their boat out there and they found an overturned sailboat and there was a man sitting on it. And they sent out the helicopter and the divers went in and pulled him up and got him on the helicopter and put him in the boat. They gave him food and water and he started getting his strength and energy back. They, of course, gave him blankets and warm clothes to put on. And then he was... They started heading back to shore, and he was enjoying this ride so much he sat on the back rail. And on the way back, they hit a bump, and he fell back into the water. And everybody on the boat is looking forward, and so they don't see that this man fell back in the water. Didn't have a life jacket on this time. And guess what? He drowned and died. And the boat pulls in, and they say, yay, we rescued our guy. They didn't rescue their guy. Wouldn't that be ridiculous? You wouldn't say they saved him, would you? You wouldn't say they rescued him. But God saves from beginning to end. God's great salvation is complete. 
if he saved you today or if he saved you yesterday or 25 years ago, then you're saved for all eternity until Christ comes back. And then there will be no more temptation that to that point will live perfectly in glory. But God says from beginning to end, completely and entirely, he doesn't do things halfway. He doesn't make it halfway around the track and then stop. He goes all the way. And what is it, finally, third point, is what is it that God protects you from? The Lord's Prayer says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, and the King James says, evil. But the New International Version rightly translates, translates it, from the evil one. Verse 15 in our passage is the same words there. It's protect them from to Paneru, which is the evil one. And because of in both of those passages, the Lord's Prayer and here in verse 15, it has the article, the definite article, a T-O-U in Greek, but T-H-E in English, protect us from the devil, the evil one, specifically uh, talking about Satan, uh, since it has that definite article. Of course, it includes all that Satan's involved in, all the evil that he does, protect us from evil. But specifically, we need to realize that Jesus' prayer is that we will be protected from the evil one. He's not praying that you will never have any problems. I'm sorry if you haven't heard this before, but Christians do have problems in this world. Ecclesiastes says the rain falls on the unjust and the unjust. And what do you expect? A tornado is coming through town and it's wiping out the houses of the non-Christians. But then it goes, lifts up and goes over a Christian house and then starts wiping. And I've seen testimonies of people who thank the Lord for the storm rising up and going over that. That could happen. But the point is, other times Christians do get killed. And the Bible tells us that natural uh, disasters fall on the Christians as well as the non-Christians. We're living in a fallen world. And so we will suffer the same kinds of problems that non-Christians suffer as, soon, as long as we're in this world. God could take you right out of the world and you wouldn't suffer. But as long as you're in the world, you will suffer the same kind of problems that non-Christians suffer. But you also will suffer persecutions. I think of Brother Yoon in his book, The Heavenly Man. When he was arrested, they said, what's your address? And he said, I, I'm from heaven. I'm the heavenly man. Because he didn't want to tell his address and they would go and arrest his family. And he suffered terribly, but the Lord also delivered him miraculously in a wonderful way. He was in a secure prison and God told him one day to He'd been beaten so badly, his legs were broken. They had to pick him up and take him to the bathroom. They had to pick him up every day and carry him into the, inter quote, interrogation room where they would beat him and interrogate and also uh, beat him. Um, and then they had to take him back to his cell. But one day God spoke to him and said, get up and go. And so he got up and he started walking and he came to the elevator. It was a very secure building. And as he came to the elevator, the door opened and he went into the elevator. Someone was coming out and he went down the elevator to the bottom floor. The door opened and he started walking to the main gate. Again, the gate opened. Someone apparently was coming in and he just walked out. When he got outside the jail, uh, strong iron gate, a taxi cab pulled up. And the driver put down the window and he said, are you the one I'm supposed to pick up? And Brother Yoon said, um, I'm, I'm, I need a ride. And the man said, well, the Lord told me to come and pick up someone here. And Brother Yoon said, yes, that is me. I'm the one that uh, needs to be picked up. And he was taken to a safe and secure place. It was raining, which very seldom happened there. So the 
The dogs weren't able to track them, and miracle after miracle. But not everyone's released like that, as wonderful as that is. Sometimes Christians are persecuted terribly, places like uh, China, in places like Nigeria, places like Iran and North Korea. We could name them others, too, that we need to be praying for these Christians. But we experience persecution as well, whether it's in um, physical torment or whether it's in um, psychological torment. The greatest illustration of, of um, protection in the midst of the storm, I think, is the ark. Noah and his family uh, and all the animals that went into the ark were kept safe for the whole time they were there in the world, in the ark. The rest of the world was destroyed, but they were safe in the covenant of God and in that little boat. It looks like a big boat when you see it in the replica in Kentucky, but it was a little boat compared to the size of the world. But what's interesting is while they were in the ark, the ark got jostled around, and you can imagine every now and then they got knocked over and hit their head or hit somewhere. They probably had bruises on them so that they, they were affected by the world and the, the things of the world, but they were also safe in the hollow of God's hand in that secret place where God kept them from being destroyed, from being killed. Oh, yeah, they had problems in that ark. They could smell the manure from the animals. They had to work to clean that up. They had to work to feed the animals. They probably had lots of work that we don't even know about. I'm sure their, their muscles hurt. They ached and they were sore. But God protected them in the ark. And that's where we want to be. We want to be in God's will. We want to be safe and secure from the world, from the um, not the problems of the world, but from the devil, from the evil one. We want to be safe from the evil that Satan would bring on us. And this is what Jesus prays, that his disciples will be protected from the evil one. Nothing happens to you except that God causes it or God allows it. He doesn't cause sin, but he does allow it to happen for his purpose, for his will. He has a plan that is above our understanding sometimes, but he is involved in our lives at this wonderful point, as Romans 8, 28 says, that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the call according to his purpose. So let me repeat, nothing happens to you, if you're a Christian, nothing happens to you that God doesn't cause or allow to happen. And he has a purpose for it, for his glory and for the blessings for his kingdom. I have a good friend who went as a missionary to Pakistan, I don't know, 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. And as he was preparing to go to Pakistan, he spoke at Bon Clarkin one time as part of the missionary program. And he was asked, aren't you afraid of going to Pakistan and taking your family into a Muslim-dominated country like that? And without a second thought, he said, the safest place in the world is to be in the center of God's will. And that's what Jesus is praying for you today and for me, that we will experience what it means to be in the center of God's will. To be in the center of God's will, we recognize he is sovereign. He's over all things and that we can put our faith and our trust in him. To be in the center of God's will, we recognize that he loves us with a special love. He's concerned about us. We don't have to worry about how bad the world treats us or how bad our situation on earth is. God loves us with a special love. He's going to bring us back home to heaven. But in the meantime, he's with us and cares for us. And even in our pains, aches and pains, he is there with us encouraging us. And the protection he gives us is from the evil one. It doesn't mean you won't ever stub your toe or bump your head, but it does mean the devil can't get you, that you're safe from him. It doesn't mean you won't ever sin, 
But it does mean this devil cannot take your soul if you're a child of God. Isn't this wonderful news today? Jesus prayed for our protection from the evil one. And we can live in this world, this fallen world, with all the difficulties and problems that we face, knowing that God is in control of my life and of your life, and that he has a purpose for us. Let me just go back to verse 6 again and make sure that you're one of those who have accepted him, that you've put your faith in him, you put your trust in Jesus, and you're living for his glory, and then you are a child of God, and he works in your life for his purpose for you will be fulfilled to bring glory to the Father and to the Son. Let us bow and pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your promises in Scripture. We thank you for providing for us eternal life. Thank you for knowing that we are protected from the evil one by your power, by your work in us. We pray that you will help each one in whatever struggles they're having, uh, during this time of uh, this sometimes discouragement, sometimes frustration, uh, some people call it stir crazy in the house, we pray, Lord, that you would just encourage each one of us that we would find rest in you for our souls. And we thank you, God, that you are protecting us and praying for us even now during this time. For we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.